going to need a couple things this morning. You're going to need a Bible. You're going to need a Bible because the Bible is all about Jesus, which we're going to see in just a moment. And I want you to find two passages with me. Genesis chapter 1, put a bulletin there, put a finger there, something there, and then go over to Colossians chapter 1 as we begin our study. Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough. And, and, and all of us are going to face trials, tribulations, struggles, difficulties, heartaches. And, and can I just say this to you? Jesus is enough. In fact, I want you to take a pen. As you're, once you get to Colossians, I want you to take a pen, and I want you to write down three challenges that you're facing. Three challenges. Uh, you might be single today, and you know, oh, I, just, I just wish I had a spouse. Okay, write that down. Or you might be a couple and, you know, you'd like to have a child and you guys haven't been able to get pregnant and you're like, oh, I just, 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 just want a baby, Lord, would you give us a baby? Write that down. Some of us are struggling with a temptation. I've been with friends all week, uh, pastors all week and meetings all week and I'm struggling with gluttony. How many of you have been there? Okay. There's other struggles that you might be going through, other maybe passions that you have that aren't uh, in line with God's biblical morality. Listen, God knows about that. God's been helping people and showing people his grace and his mercy and his deliverance for a long time. Welcome to the club. Um, I don't know what your brokenness is. I don't know what your hardship is. Maybe it's finances. Maybe it's health. Maybe it's uh, a wayward son, a wayward daughter. Maybe it's your parents who have turned against you or turned away from you. Uh, Maybe you've been abandoned. I don't know what it is, but just write those three things down. And when you look at them, you go, oh boy, this is great. I went to church and they're talking about my problems. Yeah, we're talking about your problems because Jesus is big enough. Maybe you're visiting this morning. You know, people say, I don't want to go to church because that's where all the good people go and you know about my life. Friend, I got news for you. This place is filled with broken people. You're in the right place and Jesus is the answer. Jesus is enough. Can you do me a favor? You're all looking a little tight today. Turn to someone and say, Jesus is enough. Jesus. You guys did that pretty good. You did that. Jesus is enough. Now, When you start to think about Jesus is enough, what I've noticed over the years is there's a time in someone's life where they see their sinfulness and they trust in Jesus as their Savior. They're all excited, Jesus is my Savior, we're all excited about that. And then what happens is is we start to kind of like grow cold and difficulties still come and and then we're like, yeah, we love Jesus, but like maybe he's not big enough to fix my problems. Now those three problems you got there is not the first time Jesus has seen those three problems. He's helped hundreds of thousands of people with those same three problems, all right? And and so the first thing Satan does is he suggests to us, the flesh, the world suggests to us, that Jesus isn't big enough, strong enough, or near enough to help you. And so the first thing I want you to get from Colossians and Genesis this morning is this. Number one, Jesus is big enough, strong enough, and near enough for whatever need, whatever hardship, whatever affliction, whatever difficulty you find yourself in. In fact, you probably want to write these things down. Jesus is bigger, stronger, and nearer than you could ever imagine. Now, I could put that in theological terms. I could talk about his omnipresence. I could talk about his omnipotence. But I want to put it in street language, the way that you and I think, the way the temptations come. Jesus is bigger than my three problems. Jesus is strong enough to deal with my three problems, and Jesus is near enough to deal with my three problems. Y'all with me so far? That's one thing we're going to talk about. Second thing we're going to talk about is this. Satan comes along, we got our three struggles, three temptations, three difficulties, and we say, well, okay, maybe I'll give it to you. Jesus is big enough, but you know what? He doesn't care. Now, there's a little song that we teach our kids. Jesus loves me, this I? The Bible tells me so. That's the second thing you and I have to get. And what I want you to see is, is, is the kindness of God to answer these two questions for whatever difficulty, hardship, affliction we're facing, that there is a God in heaven, his name is Jesus, who is bigger, stronger, nearer than you could ever imagine, and he really does care for your soul. That's what we're going to do. Now, you ready? Colossians, Colossians chapter 1. Look there with me. This is an amazing passage. Colossians chapter 1. Uh, verse 13, we'll start there. I know we're breaking into the end of another paragraph, but we're going to start there. For he, God, delivers us from the dominion of darkness and transfers us to the kingdom of his beloved son. You were born into the kingdom of darkness, so was I. That's where we all start. But there's got to be a time when you hear the good news of Jesus, you see your own sin, you repent, you turn away from that, metanoia, change your mind, change your mind about sin, God salvation, and you trust in Jesus alone to pay for your sins. He died on that cross. 
And it says there that he delivers us from the dominion of darkness and transfers us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Beloved, you all need a transfer. And all of our friends, all of our neighbors do. Verse 14 says, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Now, verse 15, for he is the image, Jesus, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things have been created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead so that he himself might have first place, not second place, not third place, that he might have first place in how much everything. Verse 19, for it was of the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of the cross, through him I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Now you need your pen because we're going to dissect this passage a little bit. There's seven things that we find in, about Jesus in that paragraph. So I want you to underline the seven things, numerate them, and then I want you to circle, those are the red circles there, I want you to circle the things uh, that are so important because he's going to use these really inclusive terms like all things or everything. So just kind of look there with me for just a second. It says, Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God. That's the first thing we find out about Jesus. Um, the Greek word that is used there means the exact representation. Uh, have you ever had someone say, you look just like your father, your mother, whatever, right? But it isn't, Jesus doesn't look like his father. Why? Because his father is invisible. Somebody got it. <laughs> oh, that's funny. He is the image of the invisible God. He's not talking about his father physical features. Why? Because God is spirit. He doesn't have a body. The second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, left the glories of heaven, became flesh. That's Christmas, right? Dwelt among us, lived a sinless life, died on a cross. He doesn't look like his father externally. But Jesus said, if you have seen the father, you have seen me. If you've seen me, you've seen the father. Did we do that backwards? Anyways, we did do that backwards. But my point is simply this, is that he is the exact representation of the Father. All of the glory of God, all of the majesty of God, all of the power of God is tied up in Jesus. You got that one? That's the first thing we find out. Second thing we find out, he is the firstborn of all creation. Now that word there, firstborn, that's the second thing we learn. So he's the image. Second thing is firstborn. Firstborn is a Greek word, prototakos. I just love that word because it describes something that, well, it's not the... It's not the way we would say it. We wouldn't say, you know, you're in first place. We wouldn't use firstborn. But you think about it. When we say a firstborn child, what does that mean? You're first. Right? That's simple. But we don't, we don't usually use it in any other context except in the, in the family unit. In, in, in the days of Jesus, in first century, firstborn would be describing something that is in front of everything else. And you'll use it in different ways. In fact, we're going to see Prototokos is going to use down here in the resurrection. Jesus is the firstborn of the resurrection. He, he's in front of this whole thing. And that's, that's what the Greek word prototokos means. So, so he's in first place over how much of creation? Oh. All of creation. So anything in creation, Satan, angels, anything in creation, who's first? Jesus is. Jesus is enough. You got three problems? Jesus is, don't worry, he's in front of it all. Okay. Third thing we find out, it goes on there, uh, for by him all things were created. Number three, he created how many things? All things, not a few things, but all things. And just to make sure you and I get that right, he starts describing it. It says, uh, both in the heavens and on the earth. Okay, so on the earth, every, how many of us know everything that's on the earth? None of us, but everything that's on the earth, how, who made it? Jesus did. And everything in the heavens, in the universe, space, time, matter, all these things, who made all of that? Jesus did, according to the text, right? You all with me? So he goes on from there, and he says, visible and invisible. Now, look around, see some visible. Y'all see some visible? What is the invisible? Well, the invisible are the things that you can't see but are still there. Um, if you look at me, um, I'm starting to get lines. I'm starting to get saggy. How many of you are getting saggy? <laughs> There's this thing called gravity, and it's sucking you down. You used to be taller, and now you're kind of hunchy, right? I mean... 
right? Your, your chest used to be up here, guys, and now it's down here in the belt line. You know, you know how this, everything starts to sag. You all know what I'm talking about. So there's this thing called gravity. We can't see it. We see the effects. Who made the gravity? Jesus. Someone got it right. So heaven, earth, visible, invisible. Then he goes on. Whether thrones or dominions or authorities. He, what he describes there is not only all the authorities and so forth that we see at any given time in history, according to Romans 13, but even all of the invisible authorities, including Satan himself, who is the prince and the power of the air, who Jesus is going to stomp out in the last days. But we'll talk about that another time. That's another fun story. Verse 17, or, or the last part of verse um, uh, 16 there. All things have been created through him and for him. You were created not for yourself. You were created for him, for Jesus. That's right. And anytime something isn't in line with Jesus, it's out of the created order that he intended. It's rebellion. And Satan is the father of rebellion. And eventually Jesus is going to come and set all things, subjugate all things to himself for his own glory. Verse 17, for he is uh, before all things and in him, how many things hold together? Everything. Now listen, everything in the universe is made up of these subatomic particles, uh, electrons and protons and so forth, and all of those things are being held together by Jesus. You're sitting there being held together. Hey, you're, kind of, you're kind of drooping out, but, but, but all of us are being held together. If Jesus lets go of the molecules, you know what's going to happen? Just like that, that's what would happen to you. That's what would happen to the universe. When it says he's, that, that says the heavens and the earth disappears in Revelation 21, or verse, uh, chapter 20, it, it, it just says it'll, it, it says it will vanish before, it's just going to go, Pfft. I would suggest he's probably just going to let go of the molecules. It's amazing. He's the cohesion of the universe, of every single cell. It goes on there, and then and the next thing, key thing we learn about Jesus, he's the head of the, of the body, the church. Who's the boss around here? Jesus is. He's the head of the church. That's why, that's why you're always going to have this emphasis, uh, as long as Henry's here, I'm sure, that it's always going to be about Jesus. Why? Because he's our Savior, and he's our Christ, which means our King, our Redeemer. Uh, he's our Lord. That means he's our Master. We, we follow him. We obey him. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things that I say? Well, well we want to call him Lord, Lord, and do the things that he says, right? So he's the head of the church. Next verse goes on and says he's the firstborn from the dead. Again, he has preeminence. Uh, 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 in everything, including resurrection power and glory. Someday, uh, if, unless the rapture takes place, you're all going to die and be resurrected. If you know Jesus as Savior unto life, those that don't unto condemnation. Um, it goes on there in verse 19. It says, and all the fullness dwells in him. That's a whole nother study. But the fullness, the Greek word uh, pleroma is used there. It's described the deity, all of the deity of the Father, much like the word um, in the image back in verse 15 describes all of the deity, all the fullness of God is in Jesus Christ. He is um, of the same nature, um, glory, power, majesty of the Father. And it goes on uh, reconciling all things to himself. So those are the seven things we learned about Jesus. All I want to do is just touch on one, because you got three problems that are big problems. You got three problems that are overwhelming. You got three problems that are making you stay up at night. You got three problems that are haunting you. Again, maybe they're financial, maybe they're relational. Maybe you're watching too much news. Too much news, I'll give you. Give, give you ulcers. Anyways, but what I want you to catch with me is this Jesus and those problems you've got. If he created the heavens and the earth, the visible and the invisible and all the thrones and power, don't you think he's enough for your problems? I'm serious, man. Think about this. Because we get all worked up about our problems. Just be mindful. He's big enough. He's strong enough. He's near enough, and he loves you. Man, that's pretty awesome. So now when I read this the first time, I, I didn't realize that the second person of the Trinity is the one who did the creation in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. How far do you have to read in the Bible to find Jesus? According to that verse, the first verse. Yeah, the very first verse. So you, you got Genesis there? Look there. Just keep in mind. It says, how much did he create? All things, not a few things. He created all things, and all things have been created by him and for him. Just let me one other passage before we look at Genesis. John chapter 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And all things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Just so you know, grammatically, 
if you're trying to, if you're like a lawyer or you're, you're, you're writing something, uh, a rhetorical statement, uh, the, the, key, the key thing is to state it in a positive and a negative. Do you see it in the positive and the negative there? He's like, hello, folks, don't miss this. How much did he create? All things. Is there anything out there that he didn't make? No. no. And so when we go to Genesis chapter 1, you there, Genesis chapter 1, man, we find this Jesus and he's one busy guy. It says there in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, Bereshit, bara, Elohim, et hashamayim, viet haaretz. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then you know the rest of the story, how he goes down through there and describes that. When I saw that and I connected all of this, I realized, and put it right down there, Jesus is the greatest physicist. Holy smokes! This Jesus that we worship, we sing about, I mean, he's not like, you know, some guy just living on the street with long hair. He is, he is, he is the one who came from glory, who is the greatest physicist that has ever lived. Now, a physicist, what does a physicist do? A physicist deals with five basic things, mass, velocity, speed, acceleration, and forces. And we could talk about um, quantum physics. Quantum physics deals with all the, 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 uh, the smallest particles in the universe. And you say, well, Pastor Mark, I don't care about those. You better. You're made up of them. You better. Um, and let me, let me just, give you, just give you just a couple of little tastes of this. So in quantum physics, there's, there's a whole series of things that are like so important for us to even wrap our minds around just a little bit, but like, like quantum tunneling. Quantum tunneling is, it allows for the sun. How many of you like the sun? How many of you got gone out in the sun? I've been in Minnesota. I've been waiting to get here in the sun, and you bring me this. <laughs> Two weeks ago, we had, to, we had to cancel church because we had four-foot snow drifts in front of all of the doors. We couldn't get in or out of the building. It took us a whole day to dig into the church. It was crazy. I came to California. We're going to the sunshine. Okay, so quantum tunneling allows, allows for fusion to take place so that you and I have sunshine. Um, um, superpositioning. Quantum physics has this thing called uh, superpositioning. And, and uh, how, many, how many of you can turn around? Not where, not, don't do it right there, but I'll turn around for you. So like if I said I'm going to turn to the right, and so I, I can turn around. All of you can see that. And I said I'm going to go to the left. Okay, we can all do that, right? But in, in, in superposition, the, the, the molecule is able to go both directions simultaneously. <laughs> I can't do it. You and I can't do it. But at the subatomic level, God creates, Jesus creates this ability for these particles to do that. Now, how many of you ever had an MRI? You ever have an MRI? Remember when they put you, they were laying down and they're going, like, I'm going into, ah! right? How many of you were screaming? <laughs> right? Okay. Um, and then after the MRI, they showed you what was inside of you. Now, that whole machine, what it does is it puts all of the hydrogen atoms in superposition so that they're able to see inside of you. So that the hydrogen uh, atoms in your body are, are like doing this. Ah! And then we can see inside. Is that pretty amazing? Now, we got scientists who figured out superpositioning, but someone had to create superpositioning. Who was that? Jesus. You got it right. But then we could talk about physics in, in, in cosmology, the, the, the creation of the, the whole world in space and time. Um, I, I just love this stuff. I mean, it's just like, it's like so crazy. So here, here you are on, uh, on the earth. And, this, and the earth, as you know, is spinning on its axis, right? And you went yesterday 24,901 miles. You went, you're going in a circle. <laughs> you ever feel like you're going in a circle? This is why. How many of you went to bed tired last night? Yeah, after 24,000 miles, that's a long day. <laughs> but it's not only about this motion and this gravitational pull and so forth, but if you think about the sun... You think about the sun, right? So you got the sun, and the earth is in this orbit around this thing, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm like standing in line at the, at the uh, airport, and I'm standing at the desk, nice little lady back there, she's helping me. She goes, do you travel much? Eh, not very much, 93 million miles a year. <laughs> she's looking at me like, what are you talking about? 
well, I had just been thinking about this. Just, Jesus created all things. How many things? All things. And he sets all things in motion, and he's the greatest physicist, and he's got the earth traveling around this, this, this orbit, right? So this is a, a, a complex trajectory, physics, uh, you know, all coming into play here. Uh, 93 million miles a year? No wonder you look so tired when you hit 50. <laughs> you know, you think your wife drives fast. Do you realize that every second you go 18.5 miles every second? Mississippi 1, wow, we just went 18.5 miles. <laughs> That's called fuel economy, by the way, too. <laughs> right? So Jesus is the greatest physicist. Well, I was thinking about the earth the other day, and, and um, how many of you ever tried, you know, you think about physics, so you talk about motion and force on it to make something go. So think about just getting this ball rolling. You say, well, how many of you ever tried to push a car? You remember, you're like, oh, you're trying to push that car? Imagine trying to get the earth going. Look at that number. That's how much the earth weighs. You think you've got weight problems? <laughs> I, I was looking at that number. I'm like, how do you even pronounce that? Uh, hectillion. That's 13 hectillion. That, that's, like, that's like bigger than the national debt, <laughs> which is pretty amazing. Anyway, but my point is, is that Jesus has to be strong enough to even get this thing to spin. You say, well, it's because of the molten, blah, blah, blah. Oh, okay. Who made all that? Uh, you're getting it right now. Okay, so who's the greatest physicist? Well, Jesus is. Oh, I have way too much. He's the greatest hydrologist. If you look there in Genesis, uh, I think it's starting in verse 4. It says there's a second day, and it's, he separates the dry land from the water. You know what Jesus does? He makes the beach. Yeah, my wife has this thing in our house, and it says, my heart is at the beach. Well, Jesus is all about the beach. He's the one who made the beaches. And what I want you to catch with me about hydrology is we are a little blue ball in the midst of the universe. And when I was a kid, there was this guy on television named Carl Sagan, and they would be talking about the universe and how all these, there's all of these planets out there, all of these planets, and they're going to have life form and stuff. Well, we know a lot, and there may be, but just so you know, so far the only blue planet out there is the one you're on. And you know what? That's very good for life. Because water is necessary for life as you and I know it. Your brain is made up 95% water, not Coca-Cola, not Mountain Dew, not Diet Pepsi. It's 95% water. Your blood, 82% water. Your lungs, 90% water. You need water to lubricate your eyes. How many of you have noticed as you've gotten older, you wake up and your eyes are like, like not working, right? right? You all notice that? And it's because your eyes have actually dried out while you're asleep, and you got to start blinking your eyes, get a little water going, a little lubrication going there. Joints the same way. I could go on and on and on. How many of you believe I could go on? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Hey, now. Anyways. But water is really important, and, and Jesus is the one who's made it all. I, I was riding my bike uh, in, in uh, Minnesota. I, I grew up in Southern California. <laughs> That's not Southern California in July. That's Minnesota in July. And I'd never lived in such a green place. So I'm riding my bike. I'm just blessing the Lord, just kind of thinking, talking to myself. You do talk to yourself, don't you? And so I'm talking to myself, and I'm, I'm riding my bike down the, down the trail, and all of a sudden, it hit me. I'm, I'm seeing the sunlight. I'm seeing the green. I'm seeing all of this. And I'm like, oh. And what pops into my head? That right there. Yeah. What did you see when... I mean, when you saw that, what, did you, what were you thinking? Uh, my, my brain thought that. It's photosynthesis. Now, now, photosynthesis is really important. My mom, she's sitting right over here, sitting with my wife, sitting with my Aunt Linda. Anyways, she used to tell us when we were little kids, now go around and water the plants. And when you water them, you know, breathe them. <sighs> and then you give them a little light. And then photosynthesis takes place because of the chloroform, or the, uh, well, not chloroform, um, chlorophyll. And so here's how, here's how it works. You got carbon dioxide. That's what you breathe on them, right? <sighs> Hopefully you don't have bad breath, otherwise you kill the plant. <laughs> Anyways, carbon dioxide, and then you mix it with some water. And by the way, 30 things have to take place in order to even get to this equation. But when you add those two things, then sun, sunlight, 
And chlorophyll, and Jesus had to make three types of chlorophyll, one for out of the water, one for the first 15 feet of water, and then for the, for the next sphere, he had to make a whole different type of chlorophyll in order to make this all work. But then the sunlight hits those two, and then it creates two things, sugars and oxygen. Now, the sugars allow the plants to grow. Now, what happens if plants don't grow? How many of you can be alive if there's no plants? Right? You say, well, I'm a vegetarian. It's very important to have plants. Yes. And if you're a carnivore, it's very important because carnivores eat things that eat plants. I tell people all the time, I'm a vegetarian. I eat everything that eats plants. <laughs> You're laughing at me. Now, I want you to notice, oxygen is the other thing that comes out. So they make sugars in this process that allows them to grow, which is necessary for life. And then oxygen comes. Now, can I say this in kind of, I'm going to say it in kind of like, maybe you'll think this is crude, but I just want you to remember it. The plants poop out oxygen. Do you, you understand what I'm saying? And if there's no plants, pretty soon all the oxygen is gone and all of you are dead. And you've been breathing poop your whole life. <laughs> Keep it up. <laughs> Who's the greatest botanist? Jesus is. Yeah. Uh, astronomy. Uh, okay, so, so get this. I grew up here in Southern California. I'd go up into the mountains. I'd look through the pine trees and watch the stars out there. This, this picture is 10 pictures of the Milky Way from Australia. And you say, how many stars are out there? When I was a kid, we were told there was 10 billion stars in the Milky Way. And the way they count it is they take a shot of different places, and then they start counting them. And then they multiply that and try and calculate. But you know what the problem is? Today they're saying, uh, it could be as much as 400 billion stars in the Milky Way. Now, I'm sitting there going, hold on, hold on. When I was in school, and if I got the math problem wrong, I got in trouble. Two plus three is four. And the teacher would go, no, wrong, F. Can you imagine if I had been off by only 300 billion? <laughs> My point simply is we're learning more all the time of the magnitude of God's creation. We have the Hubble telescope going out there, and he's taking pictures. Those aren't stars. Those are galaxies. I was taught there's 100 billion galaxies and now they're telling us, I just read yesterday, 250 billion galaxies and possibly another 150 billion. Where did these guys get their math at? So complex. Now, what I want you to catch with me is this. Is that a lot? Is that mind staggering, blowing? And you don't think Jesus is big enough for your problems? You think Jesus doesn't know? Look at this. Isaiah, look at this passage. Lift up your eyes on high and see. Who has created these stars? Okay, lift up your eye. Who's created all this? Jesus. The heavens declare the glory of God. It goes on. The one who leads them forth by their numbers. In other words, he's got them all numbered. Um, he calls them all by name. How many of you got to church and you're like seeing that person like, oh, I forgot that guy's name. Jesus has 400 billion stars in the Milky Way alone, and he's got them all by name, and he doesn't forget. And you're sitting there going, well, Jesus might forget about me. Really? <laughs> really? Come on. That's insane. But it's also, you know, 250 billion galaxies out there, and he knows all the stars by name in all of them, and you think he's going to not know you? Come on. Jesus got IQ way better than you. Thank God is right. Okay, he's the greatest biologist. You get down to the fifth day and the sixth day. Every time I see that picture, I want to sing under the sea. Anyways, um, but it says that the waters teemed with fish. Man, I love seeing waters team with fish. I see that picture, and I just can't wait till our anniversary because the last two anniversaries Jerry and I have had, we've been married like uh, 32 years this September. Boom, there we go. That's where we go. Teeming with fish. We're biblicists. We love Jesus, so we go where the fish are. Anyways, but you see all of the fish and how they migrate, the salmon migrate up the streams where they were born to the same exact spot and lay their eggs where they were hatched. And you say, how do they go to the ocean for four years or five years or six years or eight years, depending on the species? How do they do that? Well, Jesus made them, and he put it in their DNA so they would know. And then, you know, you just look around, other things Jesus made, bees, 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 bees. Oh, 
You know, every time I see that picture of that bee, it reminds me of the old guy sitting across the table. My grand, I lived with my grandfather for a number of years, and there was this old guy that would come over and they would talk. He had hair growing out of his ears. <laughs> and I look at that picture, and I see how he's got the hair growing out? You know, I was like, trim the hair, baby, every time I see the picture. <laughs> but you think about bees. They're just little teeny things. Most of the time when you see a bee, you're trying to not kill the thing, Right? Did you know that one-third of all the food you eat requires a bee to pollinate it in order for... You see, it, it, there's more to it than just, than just photosynthesis, if that wasn't enough. Now Jesus had to make a bee to move pollen from place to place so that you would have food. Man, he's pretty pretty smart guy, that Jesus fella. Uh, I spend a lot of time up in the mountains, and I just love, love being up in the mountains. Did you know doll sheep have... Eyes that are six times, it's like you looking through binoculars that are six power, seven power binoculars. Who gave them that eyesight? I've been all over Africa. We see the elephants, and the elephants are always standing out in the water and spraying each other with water. How many of you ever sprayed somebody with a hose? I was like two years old. I used to chase my mom around with the hose, spraying her, laughing. <laughs> Still like doing it. <laughs> Anyways, uh, okay, so, all right, so the elephants, they do the same thing. They stand in the water, cool down, you know, uh, they spray each other, so forth. But you know what? If you wave, 14,000 pounds, and a bull elephant can weigh that much, and he's standing out in the water. What are you standing on? Mud. They're not in a cement pond like in your backyard. They're standing in the mud. What happens if you're that fat and, and, you're, and you're standing in the mud? You would be sinking down, right? How come the elephants don't get stuck out there and all die out in the water? Because Jesus gave them a special foot. Look at that foot. Oh, you ladies are going, hey, he needs a pedicure. <laughs> no, that, that's not the big thing. The, the big thing is, is that when an elephant puts his foot down, the cartilage in his foot expands. And it expands and becomes like a, like a big saucer. And so he doesn't sink down. You all with me? And the bigger the elephant, the bigger the footprint, so he can disperse his weight so he doesn't sink down. Now, if you see the edges, the mud's going to seep up over the edge. So what's, what's going to happen? He's still going to get stuck. Well, Jesus made it so that cartilage, when he lifts the weight off, it shrinks down. And he can pull his foot right out. That's why the elephants don't die in the water. Jesus is the greatest biologist. Uh, he's also the greatest anthropologist. He created Adam and Eve in his image. The things that makes you different than a goldfish and your dog. I love dogs. I love goldfish. But you are made in the image of God. And he breathes life into us, and you are a spiritual being that has a, has a unique ability to connect with God like nothing else in all of God's creation. And he made us all a little different. All of you are flakes, snowflakes. Uh, but he made us all different, but we have this commonality that we are made in the image of God. And that's why Jesus comes and dies on a cross, not to save goldfish, and not Labrador Retrievers. I know that hurt. <laughs> but you. God demonstrated his love toward us, and then while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And then he, 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 he's the greatest moralist. He, gives, he has moral responsibility he places upon us, and when we uh, break that, you know, this is what the world does. They go and they look at dogs and cats and chickens and they say, well, this, th we're from the animal kingdom. We're not special. We're just animals. We just evolved. And we're going to look at their morality. And you want to have the morality of a dog and a cat? No. no, you're image bearers of God. You've got a different morality. And then you look on in Genesis there, and I think it's verse 28, and he says, you have dominion. You have authority. I'm giving you authority over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over all the creeping things. That's why you have the Labrador in your house instead of you being at the Labrador's house. <laughs> Friends, our world's getting so far away from God, they can't even figure any of this out. And the more we listen to them instead of the Bible, the bigger the problems we're going to be, the smaller Jesus is going to be. And we got to look at our problems and be honest about them. We got to see how Jesus is enough. He's sufficient. He's adequate. Why? Because he's bigger, stronger, and nearer than you can ever imagine. And he loves us. I want, I want, you, to, I want you to think about your three problems. You got your three problems there? Right down next to him, Jesus is bigger, stronger, and nearer. You got it? I don't care if you wrote it on your hand, you wrote it on your neighbor's hand, your neighbor's forehead. I don't care. <laughs> you just put it on Jesus, bigger, stronger, and nearer, and Jesus loves me. And listen, you're going to have to repeat that to yourself over and over. It's part of that self-talk. Why? Because Satan is going to constantly be lying. Jesus isn't big enough. He isn't big enough. Jesus doesn't care. It's a lie from the pit of hell. 
Jesus loves you. This I know. The Bible tells us so. Look at this little guy. Look what he does. Listen to his self-talk in this video clip. When you look at those three problems, and you got Satan whispering in your ear, Jesus isn't big enough, you go back to Genesis 1. And when you hear Satan whispering in your ear, God doesn't care, Jesus doesn't care, you'd be like that little guy right there. Jesus loves me. This I know! And fight back with the truth. Amen? Amen. Stand with me if you would.